الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praise is due to Allah and as such we should praise him and seek his forgiveness and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds. For whomsoever Allah has guided, none can misguide. And whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray, none can guide. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the last messenger of Allah. Inna asdaq al-hadith kitab Allah wa khayra hadi hadi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharra al-umur muhdathatuha wa kulla muhdathatin bid'ah wa kulla bid'atin dalala wa kulla dalalatin finna'ah Indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the Book of Allah. The best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion. For every innovation in religion is cursed. And all cursed innovation leads to misguidance. And all misguidance leads ultimately to the hellfire. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I would like to remind yourselves and myself about the importance of knowledge in Islam. A topic which I'm sure you have heard many times from me in the past, from others, you've read about. So there is not really much new that I can tell you. Therefore, it is just a matter of reminding ourselves. Because though we may know something, if we're not living it, we're not working with it on a continual basis, then it is easy for it to be forgotten in reality. And knowledge is the great distinguisher. It distinguishes between truth and falsehood. Al-Haq wal Batil, that Allah speaks about in the Quran. Describing the Quran as Al-Furqan, the distinguisher that distinguishes between truth and falsehood. One of the essential characteristics of the Quran. And Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he came as a distinguisher. To distinguish for the people, make clear to them what was misguidance and what was true guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result of that, we find so many verses in the Quran where Allah talks about knowledge. And so many statements from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he also spoke about knowledge and its importance. And we all know the well-known hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which 
He said, Talabul ilmi farida ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim. And the verses of the Quran where Allah tells us, Fas'alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. Ask those who know, if you don't know. There is a general <coughs> recognition of the importance of knowledge. But because of the fact that there is so much knowledge out there, sometimes or oftentimes, we get unfocused. Our focus is on elements of knowledge because we need knowledge in our day-to-day -day life just to function. We need knowledge in all aspects of our lives. But the primary knowledge, the knowledge that we need to be reviving on a day-to-day -day basis, week-to-week, month to month, year to year, is determined by the greatness of its content. When we look into the various knowledge areas, how do we determine what is priority and what is not? What is more important than others? We determine it by the content of that knowledge field. And the most important element of knowledge or area of knowledge that each and every human being needs to know is knowledge of Allah. Knowledge of Allah subhanahu One who doesn't have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is misguided. As simple as that. One who knows who Allah is, is on a path of guidance. Now his actions may take him off that path, but he has an idea of what the path is. He repents, gets back on the path. But the one who has no knowledge of Allah, where is he headed? How does he get onto the path? He wasn't on it in the first place. How to get on it? The only way to get on it is to get that knowledge. Knowledge of Allah. Knowledge of Allah in the sense of truly recognizing Allah in our lives. Not just theoretical knowledge, something which we read, things which we heard, but living knowledge. Where we can see Allah in the world around us. And that is manifest on our tongues and how we speak. If when we are speaking, we're talking, we're saying Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Walla ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, not necessarily like that as dhikr, but intermittently throughout our conversations where it is appropriate. I'm not saying that, we are, as I said, we sit down in the masjid, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar, you know, 24 hours a day. It's not what Islam asks us to do. But that when we see something which is amazing, we say subhanallah, not just, hey, that's wonderful. How about subhanallah? When something we thought would never be and it happens, Rather than saying, wow, we say, Allahu Akbar, and so on and so forth. That this is a part of our thinking, is impressed in our subconscious, so that it is manifest on our tongues whenever we are speaking. 
in one way or another. This is living knowledge of Allah. That it actually impacts on our lives, on our daily lives. And this is where we need to be. Because this is what keeps us in the right frame of mind in all of our dealings. The knowledge of Allah. Living knowledge. As we hear many times, it is said, Islam is a living faith. It is a way of life. All of the pillars of Islam, the pillars of Iman, all of this is a means for us to live the correct life. So we owe it to ourselves, each and every one of us, to learn about Allah. To know Allah, to understand Allah, how He works in our lives, in the world around us. With that knowledge, our lives are transformed. We understand how to deal with the ups and the downs of life. If we haven't understood, how to deal with it, then we are the people who complain all the time. Oh, why is this? Why did that happen? I don't deserve that. It's not fair. You know, we're always complaining. We can't find happiness because we haven't understood a lot. We recite every Friday Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf reminds us of Allah and His workings. Miracles which can happen in people's lives if He wishes. Trials which people are faced and how he takes from those trials good. All of it reminders for us to understand how we should traverse this life, how we should get through this life in a way in which we are at peace. Even in the greatest times of trial, there is still room for peace. Peace in our hearts. Though our minds, our bodies may be forced to do this and that and struggle, but there is peace in the hearts. Allah bi dhikrillahi fatma innam kulli. As Allah told us. It is only with the remembrance of Allah, that living remembrance, that knowledge-based consciousness of Allah, that our hearts can find rest in this life. So, my advice <clears throat> to yourselves and myself is to renew that knowledge. We renew it by reading, by listening to lectures, by watching, viewing lectures, by sitting with those who are knowledgeable, asking questions, getting ourselves clear, understanding Allah in our lives. 
We have to be actively engaged. It is not going to come like a bolt from the sky. All of a sudden, we understand the law in our lives. This comes with our effort. We have to struggle and to strive, make an effort to understand a law in our lives, our day to day lives. And the best example of one who lived that understanding is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all of the Prophets of Allah. They were the examples. They demonstrated to people, the common people, how to live that understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their lives. And they had trials. Allah gave them trials more than the rest of people. To show people. So people wouldn't think that, okay, prophets of Allah, they escape all these things. We are the ones suffering and, you know, we can understand that they're prophets of Allah. They're close to Allah, so you know Allah spares them. <coughs> but though we might say that, in our hearts we still think, why me? So Allah didn't make it that way. He gave the prophets more trials than the average person will face in his or her life. Many, many more trials. So that we can understand Trials don't mean that Allah doesn't love us, that Allah doesn't hear our prayers. Because this is what we tend to do, we equate trials with Allah being displeased with us automatically. Now sometimes it is, but not automatically. And really, even in the times when we can say it is a result of Allah's displeasure by that trial wakening us and we finding a way back then it was good for us so even in recognizing Allah's displeasure in our lives and correcting ourselves it's good That's why Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had said, Ajaban li amr Inna amrahu kullahu. The fear of the believer is amazing. All of his or her affair is good. If good comes to him or her, they are thankful to Allah. They don't become so excited, so happy, they forget Allah. If they are mu'min, if they have understood Allah, if they are following the living understanding of Rasulullah Wasallam, when good comes to them, they fall down in prostration. Sujood ash First thing. Thank Allah, Allah Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah. And then Allah rewards them for it. He gives them the good, and with their thankfulness, Allah rewards them for that good further. And He increases it as He promised. In shakartum, la azidannakum. If you are thankful, I will increase the good that you are thankful about. I'll give you more of it. And if evil comes to them, they are patient. And Allah rewards them for it. Because this is the two aspects of our life. What appears to be good times, what appears to be evil times. That's 
we live in between the two. Everything we put on the scale, it's either good or it's evil. But for the believer, it's all good. It's all good. The evil is good and the good is good. For some people, good is evil and the evil is good. Many people, when good comes, it is evil for them. When they didn't have, they were better people. When they got, they became evil people. It was bad for them. So it is relative. Relative to how we respond. If we know Allah, we're following the way of we will respond correctly and the good will be good and the apparent evil will be good. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring a realization of the good in our lives. A realization that He Allah is all good and that all that comes from Him is good. And to bring with that knowledge peace to our hearts, peace to our families, peace to our communities. We ask Allah SWT to forgive our negligence in this matter, seeking his repentance, coming back to the right path. ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. Ask Allah to forgive us and seek repentance from Him alone, as He is the only one who can forgive. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. Knowledge. The knowledge of Allah. The knowledge of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the knowledge of Islam was the knowledge of Allah SWT as the creator and sustainer of this universe is knowledge on one level and the knowledge of the example of Rasulullah in living that knowledge is another level. The third level is knowledge of the religion of Islam itself. Knowledge of all aspects of the religion that are particularly relevant to us, relevant to our day-to-day -day lives. That much is obligatory on us. Seeking that knowledge is ibadah. It is worship of Allah. This is the comprehensiveness of worship in Islam. That it is not restricted to Friday. We come, we pray, and we go. Or the five times in the day that we pray. No, ibadah encompasses all aspects of our lives. Because that is the nature of Islam. Every element of Islam has ramifications, has implications to all aspects of our life. It's all interwined. It's not often one corner where we 
do Islam at this period of time and then the rest of the time we're on a vacation from Islam. No. There's no vacation. Islam is 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As long as we are conscious, then we are supposed to be living Islam. That might seem that we can't live normal lives. Some people say, well, you know, how are you going to live a normal life? If you have to be remembering Islam all the time, I mean, we can't have a break, you know, some breaks here. And, you know, the other people, they're enjoying and, you know, we like no enjoyment. We just have to be, you know, uh, you know Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he smiled, he laughed, he played with the kids, he competed with his companions in races. His wife challenged him in races. He joked. So, if we think that living that consciousness on a 24-7 basis means that our lives become very stern, Harsh, we haven't understood Rasulullah. We need to go back and to read his life. Read his life as a plan for life. Not read his life as an historical record. So you can say, okay, he was born on this day. He, you know, he went to Medina on that day. He weighed Hajj on this day, he fought the Battle of Badr, he fought Uhud, and so on, so you have all these dates and everything. You, anybody asks you, you can tell them like this. That's knowledge too, but that's not the one we're talking about. We're talking about fiqh asira, understanding the life. In all of the various incidents, understanding how is it relevant to us. Just not knowing the facts, but knowing the implications in our lives. If we understood it, then we wouldn't think that living Islam 24-7 becomes uncomfortable, it becomes stern, harsh, severe, strict, all these terms tend to be used to refer to those who try to practice Islam 24-7. Extreme! This is a common one today, isn't it? Extreme! No, it's not extreme. It is the norm. It is the norm for Islam. What is extreme is not to live that way. We have strayed from Allah. We have forgotten Allah and gone to that extreme. Where we are now doing crazy things with our lives. Going to amusement parks and going in machines that spin you up in the air, up and down and you know your heart is in your throat and, and you think, ah, fun. That's the wrong kind of fun. That's the fun for those people who have lost a lot. Because if you stop for just a minute and think about the number of times these machines break down, you can go on YouTube, see the roller coaster that went off the tracks, how many people died, mangled, etc. But that's rare. All it needs to happen one time with you on the roller coaster and rare becomes an evil reality. The point is, Allah tells us, Don't throw yourselves into destruction with your own hands. 
Don't put yourselves in situations like that. This is not the way to have fun. That's people who, for them, living on the edge becomes excitement. They feel alive there. You know, bungee jumping, jumping off a bridge with a rubber band tied to your foot. You no. Know? And how many times every year the rubber bands break? They break all around the world. Maybe in the place where you live, you don't hear of any. But now if you go and sum up around the world for all the people who are doing bungee jumping, believe me, every week, or maybe so many times a week, there are people dying from the same act. But they don't popularize it because they want you to come and jump. Pay your money, get the thrill, but you've lost sight of what this life is about. Why put yourself in that position? It might seem, oh, Dr. Bilal is taking away fun from our lives here. You know, the young ones are saying, that's not fair. We enjoy it. We have to teach them that there are other ways of enjoying which don't put your life on the line. That's the reality. Because for every forbidden way, there are thousands of halal ways. That was the garden. That was the tree. All the trees of the garden except one. All the other ways except bungee jumping, roller coasters. There are many, many other ways, natural ways. Of course, you say, okay, even if you ride a horse, maybe you can fall off the horse and kill yourself. Yes, that happens too. It happens. So the danger that you might die in almost anything you do is there, meaning Allah controls our lives. But if you die doing something which doesn't cause death as a norm, it's not a norm, you're not putting yourself, your life on the line. You're doing something which is a norm. You drive your car because people have accidents every day, they get killed. But the norm for driving your car is not putting your life on the line unless you didn't learn how to drive. Now you're in another case. You didn't learn how to drive. You know, in many of our countries today, you have, you know, somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, you pay some money, you got a driving license and you're in the car now. You didn't learn how to drive. So yes, now you are a danger to yourself and to others. But if you do what you're supposed to do and uh, get your license properly, etc., fairly. You learned, etc., you get in the car, your car is functioning, you have it checked on a regular basis. That's part of your responsibility to check, to have it checked, brake fluid, etc. Then you are not putting your life on the line. But accidents do happen. Whereas the other person, the amusement parks, you are putting your life on the line. They are taking you, throwing you in a direction, which if they didn't have something to pull you back, you're dead. So it's, it is designed to put your life for you to feel that feeling like you're almost dead and you make it back. This is the thrill. Do we really need that thrill? No. So, it's a matter of coming back to the real world. Islam keeps us grounded in the real world. We can enjoy, we can be happy about real and practical things. With our family, our family members, there are so many ways of enjoyment, of happiness that can be there without having to put ourselves in these kind of things. And that's Islam. Islam teaches. From the time we wake up in the morning 
till the time we go to bed at night. And even when we wake up in the night, Islam teaches us how to utilize our time in a way in which Allah is pleased with us, a way which is beneficial to ourselves and to our society, a way which perfects for us the road to paradise in the life to come, which is the ultimate goal of this life. Islam is the vehicle to take us to the next life, for which we were created. We were not created for this life. This life is a process that we have to go through. We were created for the next life, the greater life. And that is what Islam provides for us. So we need to prepare. We need to learn Islam seriously. Not as it is convenient, as we feel like it, whenever we find a little bit of time here and there. No. If we are serious, we need to give serious time to knowing Islam. Because this is where ultimate success lies. Knowing Islam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us back to that reality, to make Islam a living faith again in our lives, or for the first time to make it a living way. I ask Allah to make it easy for us to access the knowledge of Islam and to keep our feet firm in practicing this religion and to share the knowledge of Islam to those around us who Allah placed us to share with, who Allah brought to us to fulfill the responsibility of spreading the message of Islam to the world. Ask Allah to forgive our parents, our grandparents, our relatives, to forgive those who have died amongst us and to give them paradise. I ask Allah to give us certainty of himself, certainty of Rasulullah certainty and conviction about Islam, this way of life which he has revealed for us. And I ask Allah to give us the great blessing of having our last breath at the end of our declaration of faith, La ilaha.